It is sometimes said that law and politics are entirely separate things, but they are not. Law and politics intersect, and law is in fact permeated by politics. This is because law distributes benefits and imposes burdens. And if you recall Harold Laswell's definition of politics from a prior lecture, then you remember that politics is about who gets what, when, and how. And so law is a part of what determines who gets what, when, and how. Therefore, law is partly political as it shapes every country's political system. There are two types of law that have to be distinguished. One is criminal law that regulates corporate and individual behavior, and another is civil law. Under criminal law, the assumption is that society itself is a victim of an illegal or unlawful act. For this reason, the government prosecutes on behalf of society as a whole in criminal cases. But in civil cases, in contrast, the conduct and relationship between private individuals or companies is what's being regulated. And in a civil contact, what's at stake is usually not guilt or innocence, but responsibility versus lack of responsibility. And the end result is a financial reward or lack of a reward. When we talk about the court system of the United States, we have to distinguish between the three different levels or tiers of the system. At the very bottom are district courts. There are 94 district courts, 89 of them are located in the 50 states and 5 are located in the territories like Guam and Puerto Rico. And they hear approximately 325,000 cases a year. U.S. district courts are courts of original jurisdiction uh, for almost all federal cases. If you recall, a court of original jurisdiction is a court where a case begins. So virtually all federal cases begin in U.S. district courts. The second court level is the appellate level. There are 13 uh, U.S. courts of appeals. They uh, handle roughly 60,000 cases each year. And they're also ge geographically dispersed around the country, just as the district courts are. Uh, and then there's one United States Supreme Court. It hears uh, between 75 and 90 cases a year. Now, district courts and courts of appeal are known as inferior courts. This is a, not a term of dep deprecation. This is a term that the Constitution itself has established. They're called inferior because they're subjected to Congress's jurisdiction. It is Congress that created them. And it is Congress that can increase or decrease their number and change their geographical jurisdiction. And in fact, Congress can create and abolish uh, new in, uh, inferior courts at its pleasure. But the Supreme Court is established by the Constitution itself and not by Congress. Even though Congress determines the number of Supreme Court justices, the Supreme Court's very existence is based in the Constitution itself. So that's why it's not an inferior court. More than 90% of all cases end in a court of original jurisdiction, that is to say, in a court that tries the case and there is no appeal. Appellate jurisdiction refers obviously to the court's ability to review cases already decided at the trial level. Appellate courts usually do not review the factual record. So if you appeal, uh, the grounds for your appeal have to stem from some legal issue. They cannot stem from asking a judge to review the facts all over again. Here you can see the geographic boundaries of the various inferior courts. The larger colored uh, chunks of the map of the United States refer to appellate courts. And there are 13. Two of them are located, in fact, in Washington, D.C. The 12th U.S. Circuit of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit handles most appeals involving federal regulatory commissions and agencies. Now, this has to be explained very quickly. Uh, federal agencies in this country possess uh, quasi-judicial power. They can decide certain disputes that are within their jurisdiction. And when one party is unhappy for some legal reason with the result of the dispute, they can appeal. So ap appeals from federal agencies are handled by the 12th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. And then there's also in Washington, D.C., the 13th Federal Court uh, of Appeals. And uh, this one uh, deals with uh, patents, contracts, and financial claims 
against the federal government. The 13th has been a particularly prolific supplier of Supreme Court justices. A lot of Supreme Court justices used to be on uh, this 13th federal uh, appellate court. And so you can see that uh, the other 11 circuits are kind of arranged uh, by chunks of the country. And if you say live in Nevada, then you belong to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And if you look uh, closer at this map, you can distinguish uh, the lines of uh, district court boundaries. You will notice that district court boundaries do not cross state lines. That is to say, each district court's jurisdiction lies wholly within a given state. Uh, some states only have one district court uh, because they're not particularly populous, like Nevada or Idaho or Montana. Uh, but states like California, because they're very populous and they obviously have a much heavier uh, caseload, uh, they are going to have multiple district courts. So California has uh, four, I believe. Uh, the number of judges on the appellate courts varies between 6 and 30, depending on the expected caseload, but uh, almost all cases are decided by a panel of three judges, and uh, it's very rare that all 6 to 30, whatever that number happens to be for a particular appellate court, that all these judges sit on one case. Uh, so they rotate panel from panel. Uh, different panels review different cases. Uh, chief judge uh, cannot serve in the, in, the, in the, his capacity as chief judge for more than seven years on an appellate court. And uh, the courts of appeal have no original jurisdiction. They hear only appeals. Um, most administrative agencies are located in Washington, D.C. That's why it is the 12th Circuit Court for D.C. that hears uh, administrative agency decision appeals. And as far as the last thing I want to mention, as far as the Supreme Court of the United States is concerned, clearly a case can rise to it uh, from the district court through the Court of Appeals and then to the Supreme Court. So this is one way to reach the Supreme Court. And there will be some cases that we'll look at in future lectures that have in fact reached the Supreme Court in just this way. Um, there's also another way to reach the Supreme Court, and that's from uh, a state Supreme Court. There are 50 states, each of which has its own Supreme Court. So if a, if a state Supreme Court decision happens to involve a federal issue, that is to say an issue of federal law, then that case can be taken by the Supreme Court uh, from the state, from the state Supreme Court. And finally, a case may begin uh, in the United States Supreme Court, every year, anywhere between zero and four cases actually begin in the uh, uh, Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, cases of original jurisdiction are extremely rare.